God will give you a chance to experience paradise, but you must understand the truth about the seven church eras first. Learn about these vital church eras and how this understanding makes plain the book of Revelation. Next, on The Key of David with Gerald Flurry. Greetings, everyone. The very first era of God's church, the Ephesus era, left their first love, and God talks to them about that and, and tells them what a terrible sin it is because that caused them to stop proclaiming the gospel around the world. Now, what could be more serious than that? Because in that first love, they took the gospel to the known world at that time, took it to the whole world. And that uh, was the last time that was done until this very end time. And we have a book that will explain all that to you at the end of this program. We'll offer it to you. But here, God explains to them today what they rejected. What they rejected when they lost that first love. It says in verse 7, a little further down in Revelation 2, To him that overcomes will I give to eat of the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. Well, what about that? This is in red letters. It's Jesus Christ's own words. And he's talking about they have to overcome and eat of the tree of life. And that is just in the midst of the paradise of God, the greatest paradise you could imagine. He's talking to us spiritually, but mankind has rejected the tree of life. And they have rejected that paradise of God. Now, we're looking really at what is called oftentimes the gloomiest book in the Bible, the book of Revelation. But here, look at what God tells us. I mean, this is what could you, better news could you hear than this? Why is this spiritual life such a paradise? Why is it such a paradise? This tree of life. We need to be concerned about this. Now, there are difficult times spoken of in the book of Revelation, but it is because they've rejected the tree of life. There's a cause and effect here. So, Christ is discussing this tree of life, and of course, Adam and Eve were offered that. They rejected it, and the whole world has followed after them, except a few prophets and people of that sort, because they're there delivering the message of God to give people an opportunity to accept it, to eat from the tree of life. Now, when you think about it, he's talking about the tree of life. That means a lot more than we normally think, because that's real life. The life we have on this earth is physical, but it's just a chemical existence. It's not real life. Real life is eternal life, like God has. And what a wonderful paradise that is. And I might, again, just remind you about this chemical existence that we have, which is really not real life. If you look at the Ephesus era, Jesus Christ Himself prepared them for that first era and put Peter in charge of the church as the physical head. But of course, Jesus Christ is always the head of His own church, and then He's the one that we have to look to. But this is a paradise God is talking about, and yet people so casually reject it and teach it as if it were something trivial compared to what God wants us to be teaching. What is a Christian? A Christian is one that supposedly follows Christ and what He says. But how did, how did these people reject, God's own people reject this wonderful truth? Because Satan the devil deceived them as he has deceived the whole world. 
But let me read verse 18 of Matthew 16. And I say also unto you that you are Peter, which means little pebble, and upon this rock, that should be capital R, because this rock is Jesus Christ, and I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. God is telling us, okay, I'm going to build my church. Singular. Where is it? He says it, and it's always going to live to right on down to his second coming. Where is it, and how can we know where this paradise is? God says it's paradise, and when God says it, it's a lot more than what men mean when they talk about paradise. This is something that is literally beyond human imagination. They simply can't get it without the Spirit of God. So, this, His church is never going to die. Well, let's just turn to Revelation 1 and verse 4, John to the seven churches which are in Asia. So, we're getting into the first three chapters, and the first three chapters are really the foundation of this entire book. If you don't understand the first three chapters, you won't understand the rest of the book. And it's not that easy to understand the book of Revelation. It is, let's say, on the college level, at, at least related to other books in the Bible. So if you lose your first love, well, you've, you've really lost that foundation. The first three chapters are the, are the very foundation of Revelation, and I'll show you why that's so, and we can see that very easily. We must learn these first three chapters if we're going to understand the rest of the book of Revelation. So God is uh, talking to the seven churches which are in Asia. But let me read to you what we wrote in our book on the true history of the true church, where we talk about the seven churches, or the seven church eras, from Christ's first coming all the way down to the second coming. There are seven of those eras. Notice this, these were literal congregations that existed in the region of modern-day Turkey during the first century AD. These churches, Herbert W. Armstrong explained in Mystery of the Ages, quote, were located along one of the mail routes of the old Roman Empire. Riders would follow the route, carrying messages from town to town. The messages to the seven churches have words of both encouragement and correction. And they clearly show the dominant characteristics of each of the congregations of that time. So, and that's all recorded in detail so that we can understand it. And we conclude here by saying these seven churches in Revelation 1 through 3 are prophetically seven eras of the New Testament church, from the first coming to the second coming of Christ. These messages are actually a series of remarkable prophecies. Revelation is a book of prophecies. It's all about prophecies. And these three churches wouldn't be in the first three chapters if that were not the case. They are prophetic. Seven eras, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, all the way down to the second coming of Jesus Christ. And so God is just using this mail route to illustrate something far greater. It's something that they had very close together anciently, but it's all seven different eras if you look at it prophetically. Let me just mention Revelation 1 and verse 6 where it talks about God has made us kings and priests. That's what this is all about, making us kings and priests. He has already made us kings and priests. You can see that in Revelation 6 of this chapter. And then on down a little further, verse 13, it says, In the midst of the seven lamps, it should read, One like unto the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to the foot, and girt about the paps with a golden girdle. His eyes were as a flame of fire. Now here, here's the foundation, a big part of the foundation of the book of Revelation. Here is Jesus Christ as He looks today. 
and then it goes on to talk about his voice as the sound of many waters. And then verse 16 says, His countenance was as the sun shining in its strength. His face is like the sun shining in its strength. Now that's something to be uh, stirred by. And John fell over like he was dead when he saw that. It was a, quite a sight, the very way that Jesus Christ looks and that His Father looks. Verse 20, a little further down, the mystery of the seven stars which you saw in my right hand and the seven golden lamps. The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches, and the seven lamps which you saw are the seven churches." That was chapter 1 about Jesus Christ. First, Satan always attacks the head of the church, Jesus Christ, and His work. And then, of course, he attacks, after that, God's own people, His own family. Let's look into now the first era. Verse 1 of chapter 2, And to the angel of the church of Ephesus write, These things says he that holds the seven stars in his right hand, who walks in the midst of the seven golden lamps. Jesus Christ is right in the middle of all seven of those eras, every one of them. They're His churches. He's spelling out and giving you a list of what it's like when He says, I will build my church. And now He's telling us how He does that in these seven eras. And He's right in the midst of them. Verse 2, I know your works and your labor and your patience, and how you cannot bear them which are evil. And you have tried them which say they are apostles and are not, and have found them liars. Verse 3, and have borne, and have patience, and for my name's sake has labored, and have not fainted. Nevertheless, I have somewhat against you, because you've lost your first love." You've lost your first love. And he says in verse 7, you this, this tree of life, you've quit eating of that tree of life as you should in the midst of the paradise of God. Do you realize what you are rejecting? Do you realize what you, you've never understood the depth of God's message? That is, in, after in the uh, last half of that uh, era or something related to that. And look what they rejected. How can we do that? How can we let this get away from us when it's, it's so much of a phenomenon? When he, God says paradise, He means paradise much greater than anything human you could ever imagine. Can we believe Christ? This is something that is truly beyond human imagination. Revelation 1 and verse 12 talks about the seven golden lamps. That's the only source of light in this world. It's the only source of light. And then uh, if you talk about this, well, that's where Satan is all, always attacking. But the amazing thing about uh, this first era, the, the Galatians were actually turning away from the gospel, the true gospel of God, in, a, in about 20 years after Christ left the earth. How do you explain that? They rejected the paradise of God so soon, some of them. And of course, when you start seeing that happen, then it's hard to take the gospel around the world, and pretty soon you can't do it. You just have a little flock that can't do it. And the gospel of God was lost so soon. Paul said, I marvel, I just marvel that you've turned away from the true gospel in that little span of time. Amazing. Let's go on to the Smyrna era, which is really, I don't have to say too much about it, because God didn't have any direct correction for that era or the later Philadelphia era. So they were pretty, uh, pretty impressive eras. The other five were impressive at times, but not like 
these two eras. And Smyrna, of course, had a leader that is pretty well known. Polycrates was a follower of another apostle that came after the apostle John. And he wrote this about the trials that they have. So I, my friends, after spending 65 years in the Lord's service, he was an old man at this time and conversing with Christians from all parts of the world, and going carefully through all Holy Scriptures, am not scared of threats. Better people than I have said, we must obey God rather than men." Acts 5 and verse 29. Look at the, uh, what this man believed in that really was really the beginning of the Smyrna era. After uh, Diotrephes took away much of John's church, the Apostle John's church, and that was beginning to go from the Ephesus era into the Smyrna era, which did a much better job. But the Ephesus era began with a blaze of glory, but then ended up in a cesspool of false messages. Truth is not false, it's, it's always truth. And only the truth can set us free, God says. Only that. Well, there's a Pergamos Arab, and they had a white stone, you can see down in verse 17, and it was just a key to kind of a unlock this wonderful plan, master plan of God. That's what it was all about. Let's go on down to verse 18 in the Thyatira era. And unto the angel of the church in Thyatira write, These things says the Eternal of God, who has his eyes like unto a flame of fire. See, they're being reminded who, who is the head here and who's talking about this paradise that God wants to give us. And his face shines like the sun in its strength. That's where God begins to talk about the foundation of, of uh, Revelation. And then he talks about the seven eras that are, that's the foundation of all this, and we need to do better than some of them did. Verse 19, I know your works and charity and service and faith and your patience and your works, and the last to be more than the first. He goes on to say, well, uh, these people understood, verse 24, they, they understood the depths of Satan. People don't realize in this world that Satan has deep thinking. He has depths that people don't understand. But this church did, and they knew this was, uh, they were powerful at this time and in this area, anyhow. But here, notice what he said to them. Verse 26, And he that overcomes and keeps my works unto the end, to him will I give power over the nations. Look at that. He says, look, if you'll just overcome and do what I tell you, I'll give you a job that will be a power over the nations. And it's more than just that. You, he goes on to talk about how you'll correct people with authority. And then verse 28, And I will give him the morning star. Well, what is that? The morning star. Well, Revelation 22 and verse 16 says this, I, Jesus, and then the last line there, the bright and morning star. Here is this bright star of Jesus Christ. And God says, I'll give him to you as your husband talking about the first fruits, those called out before the second coming. And he says, Now look, I'll give him to you as your husband. You will be the bride of Jesus Christ. Revelation 19 and verse 7, what could be a greater paradise than that that God's going to give us? We have to see that vision. We're being prepared. We have to get ready and, and get prepared to rule with Jesus Christ on His throne. What could be more inspiring than that? And His face shines like the sun. And God says, when He appears, we're going to be like Him. You can read that in the same 
Apostle John over in 1 John 3 and verse 2. When He appears, we shall be like Him. We'll look like Him. Can you believe that? Some people have said, well, that's blasphemy, but it's right there in their Bibles. And you can read Psalm 17, verse 15 says the same thing, and there are other scriptures that do. And if you want to know more about it, just request material and we'll send it to you and explain that to you. Then comes the Sardis era, and they had just a few names. They became a dead church. A church of God can die. This church just died, and they had a few names that made it, but just a few. Not a very good uh, track record there. Verse 7 of Revelation 3, And to the angel of the church in Philadelphia write, These things says, He that is holy, and he that is true, and he that has the key of David. That's the throne of God. The promise that David's throne would be here on this earth. It's on this earth. Where is it? We'll explain it to you in a booklet, The New Throne of David. And you need to understand that, I'll tell you. It is probably the most inspiring booklet that's ever been written in this church or this last era. I know your works, verse 8, Behold, I have set before you an open door, so you can get this message out to the world. An open door, and no man can shut it. For you have a little strength, and have kept my word, and have not denied my name. He really likes this church. And there was a man here that was the head of that church, and he has since died. Matthew 17, verses 10 and 11 will tell you what he did. He restored all things. In other words, you see, this is the first time the gospel was preached to the world from all the way back to the first era because they lost their first love and never did take the gospel to the world after that. Only a little flock, and they couldn't do it. It also talks about him in Malachi 3, verses 1 and 2, God's messenger, and then Malachi 4, verses 5 and 6, that he would uh, restore families and build families, which is a type of the very family of God. It's on a God plane relationship, and marriage is on a God plane relationship. God wants to give us this paradise. Today, but especially in the future. Oh, what a paradise it is. God says, don't let any man take your crown. Be a pillar. You've got to work to build a pillar. And God is building pillars to rule the world and teach them this paradise of God. What a wonderful, wonderful truth that is and how we need to realize that we do have a work to do. God says I, you have to get God's Holy Spirit, and you have to overcome as I overcame. Verse 21 tells you that. He sits on His Father's throne, and now I'm going to share my throne with you for all eternity if you'll just obey me and get this gospel out to the world. Until next week, this is Gerald Flurry. Goodbye, friends. All our literature is available free of charge at no cost or obligation to you. Request The True History of God's True Church, The Incredible Human Potential, and Mystery of the Church. Order now. The preceding program was a paid presentation of The Key of David, brought to you by the Philadelphia Church of God.